Well, thanks very much. Um, in fact, the, the very first time I presented, at, well, it wasn't the first time I presented at this conference, but the first time I presented about pulmonary edema was in 1984, which was the third time it had been presented anywhere. Um, it had been presented at the British Cardiac Society and in the spring that year at the Undersea Hyperbaric Medical Society. So the first sort of lay presentation anywhere in the world was at the BSAC uh, Diving Officers Conference, as it was then in 1984. And it's become increasingly recognised. And immersion pulmonary edema is probably the commonest cause of death during diving and during triathlons. The precise number of deaths is unknown because immersion pulmonary edema is often mistaken for drowning. In fact, I asked a home office pathologist how he told the difference between immersion pulmonary edema and drowning. He said, well, if you find the body in water, it's drowning. And that was how... And we know that two-thirds of triathletes who die during a triathlon die during the swim phase. And we're fairly sure that most of those die from immersion pulmonary edema. And if you survive, it's actually easier to diagnose, but it recurs. And when it recurs, it may kill you the next time. The, the first case that I ever saw was in 1977. I was in a boat diving with my branch. In fact, I, I don't think I'd gone in for the second dive at that point. And it was in Plymouth Sound, and one of the club instructors came up. She was 48. She'd been diving for 10 years. And on that dive, she'd only been at 20 metres for five minutes when she became very breathless. She said she hadn't inhaled water. She and her buddy surfaced at a safe rate. She was cyanosed or blue. She was coughing up blood and froth. But she said, don't worry, I've had this six times before and it, get, <laughs> and it gets better. And... Uh, her chest x-ray at the time, you've got to remember this is from 1977, so it's not a perfect, it's got a bit of a smear on it, the chest x-ray. Uh, that on the left is the chest x-ray at the time she had immersion pulmonary edema. And the x-ray on the right is her normal chest x-ray two weeks later. So you can see a clear heart outline on the right with clear lung fields. And it's obvious, the difference, that there are fluffy shadows at the bases predominantly in the, on the x-ray uh, when she's got pulmonary edema. And it's important to notice that this shadowing is at the bases, not at the top. And that's because small pressure changes make the difference between whether your lungs are flooded or not. And the alveolar capillary pressure at the top of your lungs are a few millimetres of mercury or centimetres of water different from at the bottom. And that difference makes the difference between whether your lungs are white throughout, in which case you don't survive, of course. Or, and so it's small pressure changes that make a difference, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so immersion pulmonary edema is... I'm not sure if I jump to, no... Immersion pulmonary edema is precipitated, obviously, by being immersed, so swimming and diving. The diver will start coughing or feeling breathless. And um, if you're the buddy, you may notice that if they're on open circuit, there are, they're breathing rapidly. You may see uh, you know, rapid streams of bubbles coming out. They may change to an alternative air source. Or if they're on closed circuit, they may uh, be flushing uh, the, the, they're set. When they get to the surface, there will be blood and froth uh, coming out their mouth often. Not always. If it's mild, they'll just be very breathless and maybe wheezy. But the important thing is that, that if they're breathless at the bottom and if they're on open circuit, their partial pressure of oxygen will drop as the partial pressure of oxygen in their lungs drops on open, open circuit as they come up. So the partial pressure of oxygen, they were already breathless and had a low partial pressure of oxygen at the bottom, and that will get worse as they ascend. And it may be that when they 
near the surface, the partial pressure of oxygen in their brain is no longer enough to keep them conscious. And it's at that point that people have a shallow water blackout and sink. It's more common in uh, cold water. So the first three cases that I saw were all members of my branch. So it is quite common. So in 84, I was reporting a number of cases, and three of them were people I'd dive with. So it perhaps may not have been recognised otherwise, but it is quite common. Um, but it's perhaps more common in this country because the water is a bit colder than many parts of the world. There is no doubt, and I'll talk about this in a minute, that if you prehydrate before diving, you increase your risk of immersion pulmonary edema. Exertion and stress increase the risk. A minority of people have heart disease that they didn't know about, but in fact, most people don't have heart disease as such. But hypertension is common. So this is much more of a problem in people who have hypertension. But some of the people who have it don't have hypertension at the time, but when you follow them up, they become hypertensive. And we wrote about that in The Lancet when we'd followed people up for eight or 10 years. And we wrote about that in 89. So it's quite clear that there is something, the matter with your vascular uh, pressure changes when you have this condition that may not become apparent when you're out of the water for years. But it's important to know that it can occur in even super fit people. As I said, um, just over 1% of scuba divers will expect to get immersion pulmonary edema at some time when diving, and similar numbers of triathletes have been reported to have it uh, in, in the USA. Now, the Israeli Defense Force, um, in fact, did experiments giving 18 to 20-year-old fit recruits immersion pulmonary edema. And what they did is they got them to drink a lot of water and then do a surface swim, 2.4 kilometers, and more than a quarter of them developed immersion pulmonary edema. And they proved that this was reproducible by when they recovered, they made them drink a lot of water again and made them just <laughs> do the swim again. And the, and the same ones got it again. But I've seen it in a member of the special boat service who was incredibly fit. Uh, it's been reported in US Navy SEALs and they get it in one lung. And the reason for that is, for whatever reason, US Navy SEALs are trained to swim on their side. So they get it on their bot in their bottom lung. It's reported in French Navy divers, so in fit people. Now this is um, a picture or schematic picture of an alveolus in your lung. It's a small air sac and there are capillaries over the surface and deoxygenated blue blood comes in, low oxygen content, high CO2 content, and as the capillary passes over the alveolar surface, there is a semi-permeable membrane effect if the separating the air in your alveolus or the gas in your alveolus from the blood. And gas like oxygen can diffuse in and carbon dioxide can diffuse out. And in fact, all small molecules can diffuse along their concentration gradients. But big things, such as red cells and proteins, large molecules, cannot diffuse out. And this shows a normal lung on the left. And you'll see there are big air spaces just below the bottom. Uh, sorry, just below the middle, you'll see there is a, a, a blood vessel, an arteriole. That's a, a feeding blood vessel. But the capillaries are actually surrounding each of these um, alveolar sacs. And on the right, you'll see pulmonary edema, and you'll see most of the sacs are full of fluid. The colours, I should say, are not natural colours. These are histological stain colours. Um, but you'll see in pulmonary edema, uh, the sacs are full of fluid, as they are when you drown. Now, you may be saying, or thinking to yourself, well, why does the fluid 
come out of the alveolus, into, uh, sorry, out of the alveolar capillary into the alveolus? Of course, that's the wrong question. The real question is, why doesn't it come out in everyone? Why haven't we all got lungs full of water? Because if carbon dioxide can diffuse out, why can water not, when water is in fact a smaller molecule than carbon dioxide? And the reason is that in your uh, blood, there is albumin, a protein. And albumin is hydrophilic. It sucks water towards it. And most of us have got a, an albumin concentration of about 40 grams per litre. And that exerts effectively a suction equivalent to pressure. So it will suck water in at, to the equivalent of, if it's 40 grams per litre, 24 millimetres of mercury. And we've all got alveolar, your, as far as I can see, it's a bit dark, but you all look a fit bunch. And so we've got alveolar pressures of less than 12 millimetres of mercury, perhaps 8 millimetres of mercury, say, sitting here relaxed. And pulmonary edema will occur if the pressure difference between across the alveolar membrane, in other words, between the capillary pressure and the alveolar pressure, uh, exceeds what's called the colloid osmotic pressure uh, exerted by albumin in the blood. And so it will be affected by what your albumin concentration is. So if your albumin concentration is a bit lower, you can go into pulmonary edema a bit easier. But that doesn't change very rapidly. What does change rapidly is the capillary pressure, and if you're diving, the intra-alveolar pressure, the pressure inside the alveolus, the, uh, the, um, the pressure in the gas. So if you can get hydrostatic pulmonary edema if the alveolar capillary pressure increases or the gas pressure in the alveolar sac decreases, particularly if the pressure decreases during inspiration. Now, pressure is changing all the time in your lungs. That's why gas goes in and out. When we breathe in, we expand our uh, rib cage and our diaphragm goes down. So we exert a slight negative pressure to suck air in. And when we br breathe out, we exert a slight positive pressure to breathe out. It's about five millimetres of mercury at our pressure at our mouth. And there are a number of things that alter the alveolar capillary pressure. If you've got a high initial pressure because you've got heart disease and high blood pressure or high blood pressure, your capillary pressure will be a bit higher. Immersion, and I'll go on to that in a, a bit, will increase your capillary pressure. If you're peripherally vasoconstricted, because you're cold or you have a raised partial pressure of oxygen, that will increase vasoconstriction. And the effect is exaggerated in people who have hypertension. If you prehydrate, you fill yourself with fluid and all of your pressures go up. If you exert yourself, you increase your capillary pressure again. And if you are stressed and release adrenaline and catecholamines, you put your capillary pressure up even higher. So a number of factors will add together. Now, if I take one of you and immerse you in water up to your neck in warm water so that you're not cold, uh, the hydrostatic pressure compressing your leg veins will, for an average sized person, push about 700 milliliters of water centrally. Your heart will increase in size by about half a litre. Um, your blood vessels will become engorged. Your filling pressures will go up 15, 20 millimetres of mercury. Now, remember, you've already got a, a, a capillary pressure of about 8 millimetres of mercury, we said. So if you're immersed and you put your filling pressures up another 15 millimetres of mercury, you're up to 23. You're on the edge of pulmonary edema, and that's in warm water. That's before you, you get cold or start breathing 
a high partial pressure of oxygen, which is going to vasoconstrict you. Experiments with dogs show that if you increase inspiratory resistance um, so that they have to exert a higher negative pressure, 15 to 20 centimetres of water negative pressure uh, to breathe in, after about 20 minutes to two hours, they go into pulmonary edema. The same happens with people. It happens acutely, particularly after people have had a general anaesthetic. Very occasionally, after you've had a general anaesthetic, when they pull the endotracheal tube out, you get laryngeal spasm, and um, that's a bit of a problem because you're then trying to breathe in, but your glottis is closed, so you're exerting a very powerful force to breathe in when you're, you can't bring any air in. So you produce a very powerful negative pressure and you get what's called flash pulmonary edema. Your lungs fill with water very quickly in seconds. But you can get it more chronically in the intensive care unit. But the anaesthetist will get round that, don't worry. But, uh, <laughs> and in fact, what they will do is they will put you on a ventilator and make it difficult for you to breathe out. They will put, so you've got positive pressure, you have to exert a positive pressure when you breathe out. And that higher positive pressure forces the water out of the alveolus. So the worst situation you can have um, in diving is to have a situation where it's difficult to breathe in, but easy to breathe out. Now, at the alveolus, it's the second line, the blue line you need to look at. The pressure changes when you breathe in. Um, there's a slight negative pressure, only about one centimetre of water pressure at the alveolus, uh, about five times that at the mouth. And when you breathe out, there is a one centimetre positive pressure when you, you're exerting on your alveolus to force the air out. But when you're immersed, the pressures are increased, and I'll show you a little diagram. Um, equipment can increase the resistance to inspiration and cause an increase in negative pressure, so make the, the inspiratory pressure more negative, and can decrease the resistance to expiration. We increasingly see um, immersion pulmonary edema. In experienced divers, you've never had a problem, but when they start using rebreathers. And I've seen people who've died from immersion pulmonary edema on their first, or I haven't seen them, I've seen the results of the post-mortem rather, um, on their first dive with a rebreather or people who've had it on their fourth or fifth dive. And many of these people have had recurrent events using rebreathers and then go back to using open circuit and have no problem. So there is a problem with rebreathers, and in fact, the French Navy have found that. They've reported over, I can't remember, about 40 years, 11 military divers who've had immersion pulmonary edema, and all but one of them were using a back, uh, a, a, a rebreather with a back-mounted counterlung. Now, this has got, I, took, I didn't draw this myself, I uh, took this off the internet, but it, it shows the points I wanted to make. In figure A, this is someone immersed up to their neck in water, and what we call the lung centroid, the central um, center of gravity of your lungs, in effect, would be, on an average sized person, about 20 uh, centimeters below the water level. So when they breathe in, they've got to not only exert a slight negative pressure to breathe in, but they've got to exert another 20 centimetres of water to fill their lungs because the centre of their lungs is 20 centimetres below the, sea, uh, the surface of the water. And if they've got, um, in panel B, a um, open, cir uh, open circuit um, uh, system and they're breathing from an ordinary demand valve, uh, and they're upright in that position, you'll see that the demand valve is above the lung, lung centroid. So there will be a resistance 
to breathing um, because the regulator is above the lung centroid. There will also be an initial resistance to breathing because the, um, there's often an initial resistance to op starting the airflow. But that will change if they would head down. So panel D, you'll see they're head down. And in fact, in that situation, um, the situation is reversed and their lung centroid is above their demand valve. And so the mechanics of breathing varies in, with a uh, open circuit depending on your posture. It varies more than if you've got, as in panel C, a back-mounted rebreather uh, or with the counter lung mounted on your back because in most situations the air in the counter lung at the end of inspiration, at the end of inspiration, will be at the top, whatever, the, whatever position the top of the counter lung is, it will be at the top of that so it will always be above your lung centroid. So you will always be breathing with an extra negative pressure to counteract the fact that the air supply is above your lung centroid with a back-mounted rebreather counter lung. And here you can see, so whatever position this diver is in, the counter lung will be above uh, the lung centroid. So first aid. If the diver is conscious, you keep them sat up when you get them on the boat. You give them 100% oxygen. You keep them warm. That will encourage them to vasodilate. You don't give them any fluids, even a cup of tea, I wouldn't, although it's pretty healing, isn't it, a cup of tea? Um, and in severe cases, they will, well, uh, they should go to hospital, but in severe cases, they will need drugs to vasodilate them, diuretics, they're drugs to get them to pass water to get fluid out of the system. They may need what we call um, continuous positive um, airway pressure, CPAP, which in fact forces, it doesn't affect the capillary pressure, but it affects the alveolar pressure and forces the fluid back into the alveolar capillaries. And they may need mechanical ventilation. And what do we advise people who've had this? Well, we tell them that um, IPO can recur, it can be fatal. So we usually tell them not to dive again unless we can find a cause that's treated and uh, so they're then fit to return to diving. Um, for example, I've had people who've had a, a leaky heart valve, they present, a chap who presented with two episodes of immersion pulmonary edema, we found he got a very leaky heart valve. We repaired that, and he's back diving. But in those who have no obvious heart disease, uh, it's more difficult because we know they will be at risk again. They may be the people who are going on to develop hypertension in the future. And what we found, there is a drug called nifedipine, which we showed in the 1980s, would counteract many of the vascular pressure changes that occur, and so I've usually advised people to take five milligrams of nifedipine before diving. Obviously, you try it several times out of the water to make sure you don't have any side effects with it. But if you don't, you can use that before diving, and it does give some measure of protection. Recently, people have, in Duke University have been doing work with sildenafil or Viagra, which is also a vasodilator and has similar effects. Um, there are disadvantages we use. <laughs> <coughs> well, they aren't actually the ones you may be thinking of. Um, the the, the advantage, disadvantages is uh, sildenafil is about 100 times more expensive than uh, nifedipine or was last time I checked. But also, uh, there is animal work that shows sildenafil uh, increases the risk in animals of decompression illness. Uh, so uh, it may be all right for surface swimmers on doing triathlons, but not for um, divers. Thanks very much.
workshop. Thank you. Well done. Oh, no. <laughs>